I never did singles, doubles, or triples until we all got together. What it feels like is you're practicing maximizing your force and you're practicing the skill of the lift. That's what it should feel <clears throat> yeah. like. So it should feel like you just you're getting more in the groove, you're getting tighter, you're generating more force. Um, so it's a different feel, but you will see very rapid gains in strength and then muscle. Yeah. The muscle follows the strength. So first you'll see the strength go up a little bit, and then you'll start to look in the mirror and be like, huh. Yeah. The other thing too, and this is anecdote. Um, so I, there's, I have zero studies to support this, but training this way creates a very dense, uh, hard look to the muscle. They just, the muscle looks really dense and hard. So it's a bit of a different, a different feel, uh, and, in the, a different look. I know Arnold used to do this, um, in his early days of training because he would say the same thing. It would give him a denser look to his physique. So it's, it's really interesting. It's a lot of fun. And if you don't do this, do it for like four weeks, watch what happens. I Sometimes the best workout for muscle and strength are heavy singles and doubles. Okay, so what does that look like? Literally pick a weight that's probably moderately heavy, not your max, and do a set of one rep. Rest for two to three minutes and then repeat that. Try to keep it high volume but few exercises. In other words, three or four exercises, five to eight sets each. You know, I like to communicate that because a lot of people have no idea. They think that's just a pure powerlifting workout. Yeah. But if you don't train that way, do like a four-week cycle of that. Watch the gains explode. Did you know that I I never did that until we all got together? Yeah. I like, remember what it did to your never, back. Like, no. Never. Mm -hmm. like, never did I drop below five reps ever. And even that was very infrequent. So like that was really just to interrupt my other phases of training and then to go back to more hypertrophy and supersetting. Like, I never did singles, doubles, or triples until we all got together. Because I was never that strength focused. Yeah. yeah. And it blew my mind what a difference it made in my physique. This was literally my favorite thing to do with my female clients. Because uh, it was just so drastically different than anything <clears throat> most of them have uh, ever done before. And it was like to see the progress and the strength gains, you know, from when we would start doing that versus like all the high rep and high volume stuff. It was like a dramatic difference. Yeah. You know what the challenge is? It's that it feels so different from traditional workouts. In other words, you, you do this, you know, six sets of two reps on the bench press. And you, again, you don't go to, you don't max out. So you're not maxing out two reps, but it's a heavy, you know, challenging two reps. You don't get a pump. Yeah. It doesn't burn. You don't sweat. Completely and, different experience. Yeah. So you're like, is this really doing anything? Like what's, you know, what am I doing? I didn't do this until, or I didn't <clears throat> practice the style of training until I read uh, Dinosaur Training, I think it's called, uh, which is an old school strength book. And the guy in there advocated so much for doing this. And I had done five and six reps, but never sets of like one or two. And I started doing this and my strength exploded and I got some incredible gains uh, from doing it because it was so different. And so well, yeah. you're you're not maxing out, but you are now moving a weight that's heavier than you probably ever really moved if you didn't do singles, doubles, yes. and triples before. Yes, because if I did a if I did a weight that uh, I could move five to six times, um, it was never as heavy as what if I would be working with for singles, doubles, yep. and triples. Yep. Mm -hmm. So even though it wasn't technically my max, it was much higher than a, a, a weight that I would choose to do three to four sets at you know five reps plus. So for me, that was it was such a shock to my system. This also, I attribute this to uh, you know to Justin's point. I think this is what uh, shaped Katrina's body the most since we were together because oh. she had never trained that way. Yep. And I remember getting her really excited about like getting strong in the deadlift. And I think she got all the way up to like two seventy five, which is pretty legit, you know, for someone who didn't deadlift ever and has always yeah, been. Yeah, especially like she's a, not heavy; she's small. It's yeah, like so uh, she got up that, and I swear the amount of muscle that she she put, especially on her butt and her glutes, was the biggest leap in our relationship that I ever saw her make. I attribute it to that. Yeah, for sure. and another key to this is you know your traditional strength <clears throat> training workouts typically will consist of like two or three exercises per body part. You're hitting different angles. With something like this, you do less exercises, but mm -hmm. more sets. That's the best way to do this. So if I'm doing chest, for example, rather than doing, you know, bench press, incline press, flies, I'm doing like seven sets of just bench press. And I'm doing like one or two <clears throat> reps uh, with like two, three minute rest in between. So well, it's, it's just, a different, it's yeah, different. You just feel so strong doing this because you're fully recovered. And those like rest periods are a little bit more extended 
And so it's, I, I know this is like a mental challenge for a lot of people too, that want to shift into this style of training because it just feels like I should be doing something in between. Yes. Uh, but really what you need to think more is like, well, I guess I could have probably loaded it a bit more. Like it's, it's so much more of a mental game, uh, to be able to generate that much more force, yeah. uh, in that shorter period of time. So it's not like, you know, <clears throat> fatigue is pretty much not part of this. This is all about generating force. Yeah. So, so to give an example of the kind of way that you would use in relation to what your actual max is. I don't know what my max is, but I'm going to estimate because uh, today I did box squats and I went up to about 405. I think I probably could have gone up to 435 or something like that, 440 for a max, but I stayed at 405 and that's what I did for one. Okay. With the bench press, I think today I went up to 295. My max is probably around 315, 320. So just to give you an example, you're not going to your max, you're actually going. <clears throat> You know, 20, 30, 40 pounds lower than that, or if you're if you're not quite as strong, maybe 10 pounds, you know, lighter. And really it's it's heavy and challenging, but you want to really feel the connection. You want to feel the force. And what's interesting about this is let's say you do, and I'm just <coughs> letting people know what this feels like because you'll experience this. When you do, let's say, six sets of a squat, as you work up to the weight you're gonna do a single four, um, the second or third or fourth time you do the single with that weight, you actually feel stronger, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. So like I did, you know, a rep with 295, I feel real heavy. Then I knew the second one, I'd actually feel stronger. This is your CNS adapting and your skill with the lift improving within the workout. And that is really, really good for muscle uh, definition and, and of course strength. So I always liked like a, a, a protocol of where I would, I would be, I would choose a weight that I would be doing like three. And then as I kept going in the sets, I would drop to two and then do drop down a weight yeah. to get a feel of like what where my where my like not quite maxes but getting as close as I could. So I put on a weight. So if I'm deadlifting, I put a weight on there. Like okay, I'm I'm pretty sure I can get this, you know, at least two or three times. And then I if I could get it three, I'd get it three. Add a little bit more weight. See if I could still get three. Maybe I only get two. Then I add a little bit more weight. And then then now I've got my single weight and I do singles for another two or three yeah. sets. Like that training that way for a training block, you know. So for a phase. Um, and then going back. Oh yeah, to mm -hmm. like five by five or like hypertrophy. Eight to twelve. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my. that's where you. To me, that's where you really notice it. One, like if you if you're really pushing strength levels in that block and trying to get stronger, and then you go back to kind of how you probably traditionally train. Boy, do you really see it's the like carryover. your amplitude increased? Yeah, right. Like the ability to to produce more force is just you stretch that out now because you've trained it. Uh, to do that. And now uh, it's like you have more access to, to more muscle fibers you didn't before, which is mm. a, a, a fun feeling. But again, sure. I want to hammer this point because someone might go try this and might be like, I feel like I'm wasting my time. I'm not getting a pump. I'm not sweating. There's no burn. You're not supposed to feel any of that. Um, it's a very different feeling. Yeah. It's, it, what it feels like is you're practicing maximizing your force and you're practicing the skill of the lift. That's what it should feel yeah. like. So it should feel like you just, you're getting more in the groove. You're getting tighter. You're generating more force. Um, so it's a different feel, but if you don't train this way, um, you will see very rapid gains in strength and then muscle. Yeah. The muscle follows the strength. So first you'll see the strength go up a little bit and then you'll start to look in the mirror and be like, huh? Mm. The other thing too, and this is anecdote, um, so I, there's, I have zero studies to support this, but you know, bodybuilders and strength athletes have, have speculated on this for a long time. Training this way creates a very dense, uh, hard look to the muscle. It's like that, uh, like, uh, Pavel, the, the, the kettlebell guy, he talks oh, yeah. about this a little bit where they just, the muscle looks really dense and hard. So it's a bit of a different, a different feel, uh, in, in the, a different look. I know Arnold used to do this, um, in his early days of training because he would say the same thing. It would give him a denser <laughs> look to his physique. So it's, it's really interesting. It's a lot of fun. And if you don't do this, do it for like four weeks, watch what happens. I think really part cool. of the reason why people don't do it is maybe they try it and then they experience what you're saying where they doesn't feel it. Yeah. I don't get this pump. I don't get a sweat. And then I think the other thing, which is probably why I avoided it for so long is I just didn't identify as a power lifter. Mm -hmm. I was so focused on aesthetics and how my body looked that I thought like, why? I don't care. I don't really care if I could lift 10 or 15 more pounds. Like all I care about is how I look. So why would I train that way? And I was really missing out on all the the benefits of like the point I was making that, you know, even if you just run it for a block or a phase of three to four weeks of training that way, and then return back to the training that you kind of love to do, I saw a huge carryover into that and didn't realize how much I was missing by not training that way simply because I didn't identify as a power lifter. So I think a lot of people 
they see like who who lifts singles and doubles and triples. It's always the you power. never see that in the gym. Yeah, yeah. you don't yeah. see you don't see the the petite little girl doing that. You don't see you don't see the CrossFitter guy doing that. You don't see, you, you don't see these typical athletes training that way. Mm -hmm. It's the power lifter, mm -hmm. and so you go, oh, I'm not really a power lifter. I don't want to look that way, or I'm not interested mm -hmm. in that. So you avoid it, but it has tremendous value. Oh, huge huge value, huge physique uh, value, <laughs> and it was one of my secret weapons. I think you said this, Justin. Uh, with your female clients, it was a secret weapon yeah. because nobody ever trains that way. I, look, I tell you what, you add 15 to 50 pounds on a compound lift, you're going to look different. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen. You, you're going to look different and you're going to have some muscle. There's a direct relationship. Now you can get stuck here and stay in here all the time, in which it's case now addictive. you're now you're straight power lifting. Yeah. But if you do it, I suggest people try it for four, five, six weeks see what happens, go back uh, to the other way of training, and you hit the nail on the head, Adam. You go back to hypertrophy training, and it's like, boom, oh my gosh, what's happening? I noticed like the, yeah. and I don't know this is like the CNS benefit that I got from it, but the the control of of weight Yeah. Uh, when I went to other, like, it, it reminded me of, uh, you know, I, I've told this story before. I think you guys have shared similar stories of when I was really young and lifting. I was lifting with these older guys that were like these big buff, like power lifter, bodybuilder type dudes, and- they they love to go super heavy, and I remember like the first time that they made me squat like like and for me back then like two plates was unheard of like mm -hmm. I could barely squat a plate back back this far back right, and I remember them sticking two plates on my back. I'm like I can barely do one plate. There's no way like I can't. He's like I just want you to feel the weight yeah. and just getting onto there. And he would make me unrack it and then just stand there mm -hmm. and just let my let my body adapt. And I, the, the the verbiage that he used back then I don't think he was communicating it the same way we would probably today when you talk about what your central nervous system is having to do mm -hmm. to adapt and figure that out. But I think there's something there that when you go and you lift close to your max load like that and you get good at generating all that force like Justin loves to talk about, you then go back to this 5 or 10 or 15 rep and I just had this different control of the weight. It now seems so easy to control this five or eight rep set where maybe before it, I would feel myself a little unstable at first and kind mm -hmm. of adapting to get used to it where I'm now I've trained in a block where I'm lifting singles, doubles, and triples. I'm lifting significantly more weight than what I'm now doing when I'm doing eight reps so that just the control of the, of the weight seems so easy. Look, it, it's, uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's more than this, but to simplify, there's two things that are lifting the weight. There's your muscles and then there's the command center, the central nervous system that's telling your muscles what to do. The central nervous system can fire harder. It can fire more efficiently. It could make make your muscles perform better, and your muscles can get bigger, and that'll also make them perform better. They're all connected. So if you want to see what an extreme on one end looks like, you look at an Olympic lifter. You have a 185-pound you know, male Olympic champion who's lifting weights that a 280-pound bodybuilder could only dream of lifting. How is that possible when, when he's 185 pounds? His central nervous system fires with incredible power, effectiveness, and efficiency. And then on the flip side, on the other extreme, you have a bodybuilder who learns how to maximize the muscle so the muscles are big. Now, is there value in both? You better believe it. If you can do both and train both very well, you'll develop this very balanced, strong, incredible physique that will last you your whole life, not just focusing on one or the other. Welcome back to the best podcast on YouTube ever, Mind Pump. All right, here's the giveaway for today. MAPS Symmetry. This is a program designed to balance out your right and left side to give you a symmetrical sculpted physique. And you can get it for free, but here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. By the way, you got to check out our other channel, Mind Pump Clips. This is where we do short clips of really cool things that we said about exercises and workouts. So if you just want to consume a ton of knowledge, Mind Pump Clips is the place to go. But anyway, subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment underneath, we'll notify you, and then you'll get free access to Map Symmetry. Also, we're running a sale this month, okay? So... We have a workout program bundle that we put 50% off, and then we have an individual workout program that we put 50% off. So the bundle is the Shredded Summer Bundle, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So that's 50% off. And then the individual program that's on sale is just MAPS Hit. So that's also 50% off. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JUNE50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. I, uh, I want to uh, talk about something really interesting 
that uh, I've been observing at home. You know, I was talking to Doug about this and, and Doug, Doug said, you know, how kids are so like in tune to things because they don't necessarily have words or things that get in the way. So let me, let me tell you guys, uh, you know, little, little about. kids or what kind of kids? Are little talking? kids, little oh, okay. kids. So <clears throat> before we even knew this was a while back, before we even knew Jessica was pregnant, my, my baby son, Aurelius would go up to her, was going up to her tummy. He'd lift her shirt and he'd hug her. And then he'd make this little voice where he'd go, Oh, my dear, my dear. He does that whenever he plays with like stuffed animals or whatever. And we're like, what's he doing? It's so weird. And he'd like, squeeze her stomach and hug it. And then we found out she was pregnant. We're like, this is so weird. He still does this. He goes up to her belly, lifts her shirt. And he, and he, it's, you could tell he's like playing with a baby. Yeah. So freaking weird. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's a year and a half years old. Yeah. It's like, he knows uh, something's in there. Huh? So strange. Yeah. Well, don't you believe, I mean, I, I, I brought this up when, um, Max was really young and I was going through all this, uh, I mean, I, I believe that, and we've seen examples of this like in adults, right? So if you were uh, an adult who like was born deaf, right? Or mm -hmm. you can't see, your other senses are heightened. You're because, more in tune to them, right? Yeah, yeah, those those other senses become very heightened because you become dependent. The body adapts, like oh, you no longer have your sight, so then all of a sudden your your hearing, your smell, those things get super heightened for that person. Like, so you think as a baby when you haven't developed like the ability to communicate as well, even their sight isn't all the way there. They're relying on other senses yeah. to feel the smell, like the energy, and they don't like, have the doubt, like they don't have the voice that says, "Ah, oh, that's silly." Yeah, because yeah. they don't even know any better. Yeah, they, they have to go fully off into. So I totally believe that's why i think the way we are as parents around them at that young of an age is so so much more impactful than i think we even communicate and talk about because mm -hmm. we just assume like oh they're not fully developed yet and they're not they can't communicate and they're never going to remember what mom and dad were saying or doing it's like i don't believe that maybe they'll never be able to communicate it and say it but i think it's being downloaded and i think that their senses are extremely heightened and they pick up i mean i notice it just the other, like, hey, last night the Warriors are playing. And Katrina and I are like, high, our energy was so hyped because of the game. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that Max wasn't sure how to read it. Like, yeah. because we're not like that normally. We're very even kill most of the time. It's not like mom and dad yelling at the screen and like getting all into it, both of us. And he's, you could tell he was trying to fill us out. Like, he'd walk over and he she would tell Katrina, stop. Stop. <laughs> That's his new thing right now. That's his new thing. I don't know where I don't know where <laughs> he much. learned this. This is the funniest thing ever, though. Like you'll be like, we'll be talking, Katrina will be talking, and he'll come walk over. And stop. <laughs> stop. Or I'll be tickling him and like play with him. Stop. Stop. Yeah. So, well, does so, he do that? If you guys are on your phone, he goes like, no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's so funny. Yeah, he's hilarious right yeah. now. So he's, he's this is like one of the new tendencies that. But I mean, I noticed that last night. Because I and I made a comment to Katrina, I was like, "Oh wow, he, I wonder if he thinks that like we're angry or we're mad because we're like yelling at the screen and stuff mm. like that because we're just not like that." And it, I could see it change his behavior and him trying to piece it together and figure out what it is. So I totally they think just have that, a different consciousness. They're just yeah. experiencing. Jessica said something to me uh, interesting a long time ago. She said, um, "Don't tell, don't tell him that's a flower. Just let him experience it." And I thought about that. I'm like, what do you mean by that? She goes, because once you you say what it is and you name it, then you create this uh, expectation or rather they experience it. They don't know what it is. Have them look at it and observe it. And you can even do this to yourself. You could look at something and try to eliminate your preconceived understanding and notions and just experience the thing. It's a very mm. strange, if you've ever, and it's really hard to do. I've been able to do it a few times. It's a very weird, sometimes a little scary feeling. You want to snap back in. Well, I, I remember when we were going through the speech therapist with Max, and one of the things that they teach you to do is to, um, and kind of along the lines of what you're saying right now, uh, a bad habit that we have as parents is we, when we have a kid that's that young that's developing is they see a flower, go, flower, and you tell them right away versus allowing them to try and piece it together first, yeah. right? So, you know, you always want to have that pause. So, like, when I'm reading a book to him for the first time, and I and I want him to figure it out. Is to, you want to wait versus mm -hmm. always giving them the yeah. answer? Like, oh, that's like uh, there's there's a video I posted a while back of of Max and you, of on my story of uh, he has all these Mario carts and there's like all the characters, mm -hmm. you know, Yoshi, Luigi, Mario, and like instead of me 
telling him who they all are. I let, and then I let him be challenged. And you can see he's getting frustrated that he can't remember, but yeah. I know he knows it's been said before. And so really giving them that time to allow that, to make that connection and then communicate versus just telling them all yeah, the time. Here's how it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting uh, to, to hear. Cause like I've, I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm, you know, putting the kids to bed and then uh, with Everett, I'm, I'm making him read for me. So it's like the role had kind of flipped and I want to see like how he thinks about it. I want to see like, cute. you know, like the, the way he uh, uh, pronounces certain words and like if he struggles with the bigger words or if he doesn't. And so, and he's actually doing really good in terms of like his verbal fluency and like how he understands things. Uh, and to the point where he's actually like, he's, he's starting to mess with me a bit. And so we're, we're like reading the story and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Sometimes I'll help him out. And then he's like kind of going through with his finger, just kind of like reading it and whatever. And so he'll, he'll keep reading and then he starts to block out words and he's starting to figure out ways of like, sort of like omitting certain things. So they, they look totally inappropriate. Oh <laughs> God, that's your son. Yeah. Dude. That is your son, bro. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, he's a figure uh, on his own, figured this out. Right. So we're reading like a whole, just, you know, fun facts about dogs. Uh, and whatever. And, uh, so there was this one dog, I think it was called like the SX, uh, Spaniel. Mm -hmm. And so he just like omits the first part and the last part. And he's just like right here. And he's kind of looking at me, like seeing if I see it. And then he starts <laughs> laughing. It said sex spa. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, what, what? <laughs> like he just knows their words are inappropriate. He doesn't really know it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, every, it once means... in a, every once in a while your genetics come out. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Oh, there's my genetics. I don't right know what this means, but I was dying. I was on the floor. You I, lo know? I love that. Yeah. yeah, you know what else was uh, really cool? This was a big like I, you know, I didn't do this with my older kids because I just didn't understand. Like when you're you're trying to clean up the kitchen and you're trying to hurry so that you can then play with your kid versus right? integrating him. Yeah, so yeah. it's like it's like my you know my my youngest he's like trying to help and I'm moving him out of the way so I can go fast so we can go play, and then you know Jessica's like, well that is play, like. Have them help you. Yeah. So it'll take much longer, but that's then part of the play. I'm like, oh my God. Like, I can't believe I was like, hurry up. Not only, over there not so only can... that, I think I was telling Katrina that because I. So she... now he puts, he puts away the dishes and stuff and it's all part of the game. Yeah. yeah. I also think that, I mean, not only is it become like play and fun for them, but you're also setting the table for the future. Totally. That, that's a normal behavior now totally. for him to help mom out clean. Contribute. You help mom out mm -hmm. with making the dinner. You help mom, like, do you know uh, how good the dishwasher. That is for, like, that's a really. You know how good that is for them to feel like they are a part of Yes. Yeah. 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 It Absolutely. makes, it makes a huge difference because yeah. they feel like they're contributing and helping out and we did this so i'm doing this right now i'm getting him ready because he's going to have a, a baby sister and i did this with my oldest when his sister was born and um you, you if you we see him now like there's not a shred of envy or jealousy from my oldest with his sister because he was so we, we made sure he was involved so i'm doing that with aurelius too and i bought him like this uh i think it's called a squishmallow it's like these stuffies that you know, I don't know. The kids love him. So now that's his baby. I got him a stroller. I put it in there. He gives the baby a walk. I have him change the baby's diaper. He's like, so that when his sister's born, he's going to be super involved. But it's funny because he's totally embraced this, right? So the other day he was running with his Squishmallow and he bails hard. And you're like worried about him, you know? And he gets up and he goes, my baby. <laughs> the way he says it is so funny. Oh, oh. My baby. And he's like, this is my baby. Do you have the pinchers? When he said to you? <laughs> my baby. My baby. Oh. <laughs> my baby. Oh. It's hilarious. Just the way he says it, you know, I'm cracking up. Where are you guys at right now with his uh, his sleep training? How's that been? Oh, right he sleeps now? good. Yeah. So is he? You guys have a routine now, and he's does he sleep yeah. at night? Yeah. Like? No. There's no. There's no more. I mean, he's still a light sleeper in the morning. So around five a.m., six a.m. That's like the you got to be careful if you make any noise he'll wake up and that's it. Yeah, he won't go back down. But no, he goes to he goes to bed uh, or goes to sleep super easy now. Um, sleeps most of the night unless of course he's not feeling good or something like that. But it's way better, thank God. I hope this next one doesn't have those same challenges because that was <laughs> such a. Oh, that was I hard. mean, you guys are. It's not bad. I mean, what he's barely over a year, so you guys got that. Out, you got that done by a year. So I mean, but I'm, there was a period there. Well, I remember. Guys. I remember oh. you guys having a really hard time with the, the sleep for a while there, but. I mean, that's kind of normal for everybody to kind of take a little bit of time to figure it out till one. Well, you know, know what I noticed? It's like either your kid has challenges with sleeping or they have challenges with eating or something like one of those common ones. 
So Aurelius was sleep. Food, never an issue. Yeah. I've seen parents where, you know, we will have friends and they'll be like, oh, our kid goes right to sleep. But oh my God, trying to feed them is the hardest thing in the world. So, I mean, pick your poison. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to have to. I mean, I feel like the sleep training thing never stops. I think you're always, I mean, hopefully. You get regressions constantly. Yeah, yeah. Up until like, like five. Yeah, you feel like you're, oh yeah, things are going great. And that's like, oh, like right now we're gonna, we're in the middle of having to break him again because we went on that run from like October of last year till now before we did the surgery of him just being sick and so when he's sick like i'm totally flexible yeah, with him like coming in the guy feels terrible he can't breathe mm -hmm. like so when we would put him down he'd wake up around like midnight or one and then he'd come in the room and then he would climb in the bed but now he's feeling much better and we're back on the recovery but then he's been trained so well to like just come in there all the time and so having to re-break that of like okay mm -hmm. stay in your bed dude let's get back to bed so we're working on that again yeah. right now. Dude, I read this um, this <clears throat> article on a study. And, you know, these studies just keep confirming um, old wisdom. But it was a study done on, oh, uh, God, what are they? Uh, they're not Native Americans. They're in Canada. What do they call them? They uh, they have a, another term for them. Uh, Inuit? Is not, Inuit? No, no, no. There's a, they, there's a, like, traditional. I don't remember what, what they're. But it's the, it was, it's the natives of Canada. Okay. And there was a study that was done on the best type of diet. For them, because their rate of diabetes and obesity was even higher than the you know Europeans that came and in, in, you know to Canada or whatnot. So, and you see that here in the U.S. as well. And in the study, okay, here's here's one of those duh studies. They found that the traditional diet was absolutely the best for them. In other words, eating the way that their ancestors ate mm. produced the best outcomes. And I, I think that this is uh, in, indigenous peoples. Thank you. The the, the first first nations. Yes. So uh, this is true. This is true. Somewhat true across the board. Generally true, I should say, because there's always individual variances. But traditional diets work best for most people. And the question is why? Why is that? Because our bodies didn't evolve in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We co-evolved with our environment. We evolved to the point where the foods that were available that we ate and the way we prepared them is what are the the people that survived and procreated that was what was best for them so if you're ever a, like a, a, you know curious or confused as to what the best diet is for you a great way to start is to go with it you know what they would call ancestral or mm -hmm. traditional type of diet it works for generally speaking it works best for most people i mean isn't this where you start like kind of factoring in some of those epigenetic uh, variables where it's like uh whatever you're a potential to um, unlock and express like based off of like your, your past history uh, you, you may have like a certain um, uh, it, like intolerances or certain, yes. you know, things that you may find um, based off of like uh, what, what your gene pool had like previous to you. hundred yeah. percent. Absolutely. This is why I don't like though, when they take from like uh, a very specific blue zone, and then whatever diet that they're running in there and try and make the case and argument that that's the diet yeah. for everybody. Yeah. We had somebody on our uh, YouTube channel like a couple, I don't know, maybe a month ago or a week ago. I was kind of going back and forth with them because they're, you know, some vegan advocate and they live down in Lo Lola Limo or Lolindo. What's the, what's the Loma Linda? Loma Linda. Loma Linda. Yeah. And I, what's the, the Seventh Day Adventist? Linda. Yeah, and I think they're I think they're all are they vegan? Is that what the vegetarian? Yeah. So and it's part of their religion, so they're really strict about it. But yeah. there's other things that they're also part of the religion that have to do with health as well. So there's well, some of course, the living people. Yeah, community and they're they're, yep. they're walk or out by sun. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot. That's what I'm saying. Like and so because they th this person was arguing with me back and forth and like I live here, I know, you know, it's like okay, dude. I'm like whatever. You just keep believing that. They keep drinking the Kool Aid. <laughs> That, is that for you, for that group, for that that area, like that has worked really, really well for those people. That doesn't necessarily mean the rest of the world are going to get the same results as that that community did for that because that probably goes back like hundreds of years. Well, of people also, that way. also what it is, people are looking at the wrong things. They're looking at the diet and saying it's the lack of meat. That's not what it is. If you look at traditional diets across the world and you look at long living peoples across the world. There's commonalities among them. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are higher protein, higher fat. Some of them are higher carbohydrate. But here's the commonalities. They're all whole food based. Okay, None of them are heavily processed food based. Number two, none of them overeat. So whether it's the, a traditional diet that is lots of goat cheese and goat meat, meat and goat milk and you know berries, or it's a diet that's high in you know uh, tubers and certain starches and fruit and fish, 
what you find is whole natural foods, they don't overeat, and there's some form of daily activity, and then there's community. Those are the things that they all have in common. So when I say about traditional diet, that's where you should start. Then if you want to get into the details and say, oh, I do better with carbs, I do better with protein, I do better with fats, you know, I do better with meat or fish, that's totally fine. But that's what you find. You, what you won't find are any traditional diets that are high in packaged processed foods or that are high, super high in calories. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's well, the there's what, what is there? Seven or eight blue zones in the world. Yeah. And, the, and the, I don't think any of them are that like as far identical? as their, yeah, identical no. as yeah. far as their diet, their diets are all over the place. No, oh. the longest living men in the world are in Sardinia. This is an Island off the coast of Italy. Okay. So I have family in, in Sardinia. So I, I have a little bit of insight in how they eat. If you live on the coast, you eat a lot of fish. You live in the hills and the mountains. You mm -hmm. eat a lot of a lot of uh, products from goat and pork. Okay. Yeah. In fact, old school, there were people that lived in the in the, in the mountains and they didn't even know how to swim. Okay. But they were active every single day. It was whole natural foods, and they didn't overeat. They didn't overeat. You know, it was like one. It was like one larger meal, and then like really small meals in the morning and that was pretty much it do you ever think we're going to be able to really pinpoint this to the individual in terms of like i do tying in ancestry.com with like you know your your whole nutritional profile and then kind of linking tracing back like what's worked in the past within I you, you know your own specific environment now and all that kind of I, stuff. I agree with adam i yeah. think cgm is one step towards that yeah, yeah. where is cgm you see your individual blood glucose response, okay? Which can be very different from person to person. It's really interesting. Like there's people that have, uh, that we've observed, have a glucose response that's high to like avocado, mm -hmm. like a bunch of fat, like what the hell? Obviously they have some kind of intolerance, so it's an immune response. So CGM is, is, uh, is the first step. And then I think the next step will be monitoring other reactionary factors like inflammatory markers and stuff like that. But CGM is pretty damn good. And uh, with NutriSense, which is that's the, what a company we invested in, you actually work with a dietitian that helps kind of pinpoint. That's about as individualized as it can get right now. I don't know anything else that gets more yeah, individualized. Yeah, that's pretty that. specific mm -hmm. uh, to the individual, which is cool to see that. And I, I mean, we all had hopes for that with CGM being more of like a, a mainstream thing because before that it was like medical and you had to like yeah. go through your doctor to kind of receive one. Right? No, well, it's moving that way right now. I, I read, I forgot what the statistics were on the amount of people that use glucose monitors and where, where it was just a year or two ago, where it's at now, and where they project it in, in the next year or two. So it's making its way to mainstream. Could you it. imagine if we had this tool as trainers? Yeah. Oh, I know. I would have ran laps with this. It would have been awesome. Well, imagine if you could, you could show your client and say, hey, look, your glucose spiked here. Like, well, I didn't eat anything. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but something stressful happened. Oh, yeah, I got an argument with my daughter. Yeah. Or, oh, my God, this lack of sleep is causing that. And say, look, when it drops after the peak, do you remember how you felt at that time? Oh my God, I was cravings or I felt irritable. So they start to connect. I can't get more individualized than that. We used to just base it off of reporting how you feel and stuff, which, yeah. you know, through that process is you can get really good too, but it's not as objective where well, you see the number and yeah. the data yeah. and it's right there. So, I mean, I've identified for myself that uh, the best foods, and I know a lot of people like this too, the best foods for me are, are typically meats. Mm -hmm. Red meats, I do really, really well. Same, yeah. Really well with red meats. I do better with red meat than I do with chicken, and I do good with chicken, um, and even better than fish. When I eat a high a diet that's higher in in either ground beef or bison, um, I just or just of course steaks. I just feel so my you, absolute best. You say that, but I actually, for me personally, I I feel I do better with white meats and fishes, mm. and then if I do red meat. I can actually tell a difference. So last night we actually had um, lettuce wraps from Five Guys, and even though it was a lettuce wrap, I didn't have I didn't have the gluten and stuff like that. I still the the cheese and the meat, the combination of the two of those it's inflammatory for yep, you. Yep, yeah. still and but I do that now. If I were to do that with like grass fed beef. I don't get the same feeling. Wow. So I notice a difference between even even if you add the cheese. So I, that's so what I haven't teased out yet is to see if it's more the red meat that I'm getting from them that's not grass fed or it's the combination of both that and the cheese or the cheese. I don't think it's just a cheese because I'll have dairy and other aspects of my diet and it by itself is not enough. I feel like it's the combo that insults it enough to where I get this inflammatory so, response. So I, and I get really bloated from it. Like that's a light meal for me to have wow. two burgers and a lettuce wrap. It's not a lot of calories, but afterwards I literally feel like I'm super bloated. Weird. Now it goes away by morning time so i'm fine but the initial response 
I feel that way. And it sucks because I love it and it going down and it's easy and convenient. It's one of Katrina's favorite meals. She doesn't get that reaction to it. If I go have like our grass fed beef, I don't feel that way. So I so the the majority of the meat that I eat is from Butcher Box, so it's all grass fed. But I also notice that if I go off that and I eat a lot of uh, I don't know conventional red meat that it doesn't feel quite as it's so it's got to be the fatty acid profiles where I w what I would point to because that's the biggest difference. Is the I think it's the combo because maybe that by itself doesn't but, but with the cheese also because cheese by itself doesn't I have cheese on all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. and I, it doesn't bother me the same way like we one of our favorite dishes we do shredded cheese avocado rice um and like make like almost like a burrito bowl or a homemade burrito mm. bowl i crush that all yeah. the time no problems katrina makes this uh, healthy kind of lasagna pasta dish that we make that's got it's, cheese all over it it's doesn't be bother the fats me because it's the the it's not grass fed so it's, it's gonna be higher in the omega sixes obviously saturated fat cheese very high Whoa. in saturated fat and omega sixes yeah. they use the plastic cheese though that's like the american like it's the to me that's not even real cheese mm. like let's be honest so that's what it could be right like i'm getting that kind of crappy fake cheese i'm getting that the highest quality of beef and the combo of both of them and if it's a crazy storm if i have it on a bun if i have it on a bun oh, like, throw gluten on top of it yeah yeah then, then it's just it sucks that i i get that reaction that way have so, you guys tried the they have this pack i don't know if they're if it's available anymore but it's like a it's like a soppressata you know capicola mortadella type deal from butcher box so it's got like the the italian deli meats but they're all minimally processed no nitrates no uh -uh. oh bro it's, I mean, I love that. I grew up eating that kind of stuff yeah. where my, my, my family would smuggle it from Italy. You literally had to smuggle it, by the way. Don't they, they have like charcuterie it. stuff? Is That's that what I mean. you're talking about. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's so good, dude. I'm a big charcuterie guy. Yeah, I know. Butcher Box has that? They, I was, I, I've ordered it now two or three times. I don't know if it's still available. So now you can do add-ons. You mm -hmm. can, you could do an add-on and it'll give you um, the sliced, you know, like Italian style charcuterie type de deli meat. And it's really freaking good. Oh, wow. Look at Doug just pulled See? up. See? American cheese isn't even considered to be real cheese. It's called a pasteurized cheese product. Huh. Isn't that funny? Yeah, that is funny. Pasteurized. Of course, it's called American cheese, yeah. If, and it's if only the American used 51% real cheese, so 49 of that shit's fake. If it says cheese product. Yeah, it ain't even real, dude. Then you know. Yeah. I remember one time. I, I wonder if that's say. So I wonder if that's an FDA thing. Like the fact that it's fifty one, they can call it cheese. If it was forty nine and flipped the other way, they could. You're a hundred percent right. But they can't call it cheese. They can call it a cheese product. Yeah. Like it has to be seventy percent. -like. Yeah. I, I, I remember one time uh, buying candy for it was for Easter, and there was this chocolate bunny, and it was like inexpensive or whatever. And I looked at it, and it said. Chocolate flavored candy. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> What's the difference between chocolate so what and chocolate is flavored it? candy? Just like wax? Yeah, like, like I didn't buy it's it. That's probably what it was. Yeah, probably but like a wax, right? I didn't buy it. I was like, ah, I get the one Gross, that says chocolate, yeah. not the chocolate flavored one. You oh, know? wow. Hey, check this out. Look, there's a lot of companies out there that sell vitamins and nutrients, but the problem is you don't absorb them well. Okay. Enter uh, a company we work with called Live On Labs. They use liposomal. Technology. Now, to, to kind of not go too deep into the weeds, what this is is they take these nutrients, they surround them with a uh, liposome, which is usually phosphatidylserine or something like that, and that allows it to get to the target tissues. So the absorption rate is much higher. In fact, if you were to take regular glutathione versus liposomal glutathione, only liposomal glutathione will raise glutathione levels in your blood. So this company, Live On Labs, does this with all their nutrients. And right now, you can actually get lipoglutathione for free when you bundle it with B-complex and vitamin C. It's just a promotion they're running right now. So go check this company out. Go to liveonlabs.com. That's L-I-V-O-N-L-A-B-S.com forward slash M-P for that offer. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first question is from Danny HZ. What are your guys' thoughts on the keto diet for muscle growth? Uh, Sucks, yeah. unless you're a buck 05. That's right. Next question. <laughs> there it no, is. That's not, that's not everything. I mean, it's kind of true, though. It's you know kinda, what? It's kind of true. And, uh, There's general, I mean, we can answer this generally, but then, of course, yeah. on an individual basis. That's just my opinion. There's definitely, there's definitely cases where this is a good idea. Generally speaking, uh, it's really hard to gain size and strength on a ketogenic diet just because it's it's so hard to eat the right amount of calories yeah calories are, are so low in this diet it's, like it's it's just and you think you wouldn't think so right because keto's high in fat fat's high in calories but it's so satiating yeah. 
it's really hard to eat in bulk this way. Um, and uh, that makes it tough. And then carbohydrates are also great for performance. So studies are pretty clear on this. If you, for maximal strength, carbohydrates give you better strength. Now, ketogenic diets for like long stamina endurance can be right. pretty good, but for strength, not so great. But I had challenges with this just because I couldn't eat enough. It was yeah. just so filling. I was like, I can't eat another avocado. Like I can't eat more steak Where it and makes bacon. sense, and I'll, I'll steal what you, I, I'm sure you would say anyways, is that if you're somebody who... If you don't eat the ketogenic diet, like you have issues, right? So if you have all kinds of autoimmune issues and your gut's all messed up, and the only way you feel good mm -hmm. is by eating a ketogenic diet, bingo, then it is the best diet for you yes. to build muscle on because you're healthy now. If you are falling, better. yes, if you are following the ketogenic diet because you find that it, it helps keep you better about eating lesser calories, and you are your friends doing it, and so you want to try it too, and it's worked well for losing body fat. And now you're asking, is this a good diet for me to try and build muscle on? I would say absolutely not. That was we. So when I went through it uh, years ago on the podcast, when it was just getting really popular, uh, you know, for shits and giggles, we all decided to uh, do it, right? Let's just see how we feel. We'll go through it. Not any of us felt that we needed to or had to. I think Sal was feeling good on it. And that was kind of what promoted yeah. all of us to like, okay, let's Let's give it a whirl and see how we all feel. I was in the height of competing at that time and was eating close to 5,000, 4,500 to 5,000 calories or so, give or take. And it was really tough just to hit my maintenance mm -hmm. uh, uh, for that. So much less if I had to build. It's or just grow. so satiating. Yeah, and, and, and what I found was in order to hit my calorie intake for my size, and that's why I made the joke of if you're 105 pounds maybe, okay? But if you... For in order for me to hit four thousand plus calories, I found myself eating tons of uh, macadamia nuts, butter, uh, avocado. Just uh, there was a, a, a handful of foods I was eating a it's lot. Super of. limited. Yeah, it was very limited on my choices to to fill those calories up. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this can't be ideal for me to be consuming this much of the same foods just so I could hit the calorie intake. I wonder if this question was spurred because of like Dom Diagostino, right? Because he did. Uh, deadlift. Uh, yeah, I remember from like being in a fasted state, or even like going through the ketogenic diet quite a bit. And he's a really strong guy. And it's like I think we just have this um, sort of again, like see, like looking at somebody else and and thinking that that might work for you individually. It's it definitely is is uh, the, the variances are crazy. Yeah. So I mean, I've had on and off um, gut health issues and a ketogenic style diet in the past has been good for my gut health issues. Carbohydrates tend to aggravate them. So in the past, when this would happen, I would eliminate carbohydrates. I'd increase my fat intake, keep my protein intake high, and it would improve my health. And that's what made it a good diet for me for strength and for muscle, because the op, the other option was to feel, you know, inflamed and bloated and have gut issues. Right. So if it makes you healthier, it's going to work for you. Now today, I, I, my gut issues right now are all but non-existent. So now I eat carbohydrates because it works better for me. I'm stronger and I feel better. But I will say this. I do notice a difference in my mental clarity between the two. If I want to be mentally sharp, if I get my body to run off of ketones, I do feel very sharp. And I've heard people talk about this. I don't think this is true for everybody though. But for me personally, even now, I know that if I'm going to be on a podcast or I'm going to do something where I want to be really, really sharp, yeah. I'll I'll avoid carbohydrates oh, for two or three fueling days. Fueling off of ketones, yeah, it does the same for me in it terms does. of mental clarity. This is another question, too, that highlights why I'm so annoyed by diets in general, though, too. Like, okay, so let's, let's take you, for example. There's very few people that I know that are like, um, what is, Michaela Peterson. Right, that where she was like just everything affected her, and the only thing that didn't make her feel terrible was just meat. Right, yeah. there very few clients I've ever met are like that. Super rare. A lot of clients I've met, there's specific carbohydrates that they're doing, primarily things like gluten and sugars and stuff like that that tend to upset them. But things like rice, sweet potato, yams. I've yet to meet a client that can't digest that and doesn't feel good eating that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why follow a, a diet as specific as like the carnivore, the keto diet, if those things don't make you feel bad? Why not run a keto-ish or carnivore-ish 
diet where you eat primarily meat, but then you allow yourself to have these things like rice, sweet potato, mm -hmm. yams, maybe mm -hmm. some vegetables that maybe don't bother fruit, you. Yeah. yeah, or fruit, right? That doesn't bother you that really will complement those energy levels, will help complement building muscle. Like this idea that we, if we decide that we're going to go keto or we're going to go carnivore, that we have to like follow the guidelines. Like I have to be so yeah. strict about it. It's like, well, maybe what it is that makes you feel so good about following that diet was certain things that you eliminated. Yeah. That's what, in my experience, whether it be a client that swears by being vegan, a client that swears by being keto or swears by being carnivore or swears by being paleo, it's not the fucking diet. It's what they got rid of in their diet that was previous. Mm. And so instead of falling in love with these diets and saying, oh, I need to follow this diet, maybe look into what was it you were eating before that didn't make you feel well, keep that out the fucking diet, but then start to introduce yeah. some of these other foods that have tremendous value for you. Yeah, and also it changes as you get older, as the context of your life changes. Um, I know, for example, for me and for a lot of people I've worked with, a ketogenic style diet is very satiating, okay? That might make it a good option for cutting. It is for me. If I'm trying to get leaner, then I tend to go higher fat, lower carbohydrate with my lower calorie just because it, it's easier for me uh, to deal with the hunger. And so I have less of the hunger, less of the cravings as a result. Also, I said earlier, mental sharpness, it's on a different level when I eat ketogenic. So I'll modify it depending on you know when I need that kind of stuff. Or if I'm feeling kind of down or tired, I may eat that way. Or if I want to go on a strength cycle, I want to start adding muscle. Well, that's when I'll throw the carbohydrates in. So this is where it's really good to know yourself, know what works for you, and then always stay open because things can change. Your, your body can change. Your reactions to food changes. And this is what allows you because if your diet is rigid, your lifestyle is not the same. Your lifestyle is not rigid. So if everything stayed exactly the same all the time, you never aged, you slept the exact same, all your stress was the same, everything was identical. Yeah, well, now you got your diet that works. So stick to that. But things change. It only makes sense that your diet should change uh, along with it. Next question is from Ducali84. How do you get yourself back into lifting when depression has taken over? This is discipline. This is where discipline kicks in. So you're not going to have your best workouts. You're not going to have your kick-ass, fun workouts. What you're going to do is you're just going to do it and just yeah. go through the motions. And it's way better than not doing it. And I've gone through periods of this where, uh, you know, I went through a really, really tough period years ago in my life. And there was a lot of really challenging things that happened and my workouts sucked, but I showed up and I literally went through the motions and it was, it really helped a mm -hmm. lot. And, you know, Arthur Brooks is an expert on happiness and I always turn to him for stuff like this. And he says, you know, when you're feeling really down, oftentimes the things you don't want to do is exactly what you need to do. So like when you're depressed, you want to be alone, you don't want to talk yeah. to anyone. He's like, that's when you should probably go Call and a friend. be yeah, around people. Yeah. yeah, you know, or go outside. Oh, I really don't want to go outside. Well, he says, you know, just kind of do it. Go through the motions. So that's the discipline part. What you don't want to do is allow your feelings necessarily to dictate uh, what you do and what you don't do in terms of taking care of yourself. Because when you feel down, you get this, this feedback loop where I feel down. I don't want to work out. I don't want to move. Not working out, not moving makes me feel worse. Right. And then you kind of goes down. And this is especially spiral. important to, um, you know, start, start getting rid of that pressure in terms of like having to be so effective and productive in the gym and uh, crush your workouts. Like, you know, I know I'll, I'll, this is still something that a lot of people struggle with in terms of like, is it even worth my time yeah, uh, yeah. to go? Even if it's like the shortened amount of time, or I just don't feel like I have that kind of energy to, <clears throat> Uh, really get after it Well, just moving and in general, but also like just going through those uh, exercises at maybe a lower weight will help to start at least stimulating that and, and pull that momentum back up so you can you can build upon that again. So I, I, I like what you said, and I, not necessarily that I disagree with Sal, but I think one of the things, and I've been through this before, that used to hang me up and I think where is people have this idea that, you know, oh, you just got to discipline yourself and you just have to get through it. And that's the best thing for you. But it's, that seems like such an overwhelming task when you're in that space, when you're depressed, when you don't want to move, when you want to do anything, an hour workout sometimes sounds really hard. So the strategy that I have in, in, for myself employed is, okay, I'm not going to say that I have to do this hour workout and follow all of my MAPS anabolic routine. I'm just going to go there. And maybe I'm just going to do, maybe what I'll do is I'll set the bar really low. I'm just going to do a set of squats, one. 
Mm-hmm. One set of and you what you'll find out is if you set that bar really low, that that and that's not a waste of your time. That's better than what you were potentially gonna do, mm-hmm. which is gonna sit on the couch and feel sorry for yourself. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go over there and I'm just gonna do one, one set. One set. I could do anybody could do one set of something, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna give myself this really big and what ends up happening is go like, oh, I could do another well, one. I'm still here. Yeah, I'm here already. The bar, the way it's other I could do one but more. But it's a win even if you just did one. Well that exa- is. you're right. Yeah. You and that's that's out. why and you gotta have you gotta be okay with that. We, we look at it as like it has to be this kind of all or nothing thing where it's like, oh, either I'm sitting on the couch doing nothing or it's like, oh, I got to really push myself and get in the gym. It's like, no, you don't. Go in there and just go do one set and give yourself that freedom to potentially just go do one set and say, you know what? I'm just not feeling today. That's, that's exactly what yep. I did. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, to get more specific, and I had somebody tell me this once uh, for writing content because I remember if I'm really in the mood, I can write so much content. If I'm not in the mood, it's really challenging. And I told a friend of mine who they were a writer and they said, well, here's what you do. Every day, if you have a big project, every day schedule whatever it is, 30 minutes or an hour. And the only thing you're going to do is you're sit in front of your computer and do nothing else. If you write, you write. If you don't, you don't. But you got that hour to sit there. And I did that and it was so effective. Now, there was some times where I just sat there and that was the deal I made myself. I'm just going to sit here and not do anything else. Sometimes you just stare at the screen. Right. right? But usually, and usually I would write at least a sentence or a paragraph. So, that's exactly what I do with my workouts. Is yeah. I showed up, and I'll give—I mean, I'll give you some examples of what my workouts look like. I would, and this was—I mean, this was a really hard time. I had somebody really close to me that was slowly dying, and I was going through divorce. This was all within the course of like a two or three year period. I showed up to to my gym, and I said, "Okay, from I don't remember what the time was, but it's like from you know twelve to one is my workout time." And I'd sit down and I'd sit on the bench and I'd look at the clock, and sometimes I'd go do a set of squats. Other times I would just stretch. Sometimes I do three or four exercises, but I would do something and I was there and I showed up and it kept me afloat. It really did keep, that's what I mean by go through the motions. It's like, you just, that's the discipline part is you show up and you say, okay, I'm going to try and do something, even if it's the smallest thing. But you're, but one thing you have to understand is it's not going to be your PR kick ass. If that's your mindset and you think, well, these are what my workouts have to look like, then you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to want to do anything. Next question is from James Errors 95. I'm six week six weeks into my summer cut and I just hit a squat PR. How does this happen? Oh man. <laughs> this has happened to me before. It has happened, it's happened to me too. Yeah, this yeah. is when your workout programming is so damn good that you get uh better at the lift. Your skill improves, yeah. your CNS fires better. And you actually are able to lift more. A lot of strength is a skill. Yeah. A lot of it. It's not mm-hmm. just the size of your muscles, but the skill of the lift yeah. and the technique. Continual and, practice of it. Yes. Yeah. So this is happening to me before. I'll go on a cut. And because my programming is so dialed, I'll see my strength. This is, by the way, this is like the best place to be on a cut. If you get stronger on a cut, you are really moving in the right direction. I actually experienced this quite a bit um, when I was competing. And I, I attribute, obviously, good programming because I had to be during that time. Um, and just consistent. I never in my entire lifting career had been so consistent. And that just highlights what you're saying, that it's such a skill, especially with things like squatting and deadlifting. And never in my life had I strong months and months and months of not missing and being showing up and showing up regardless if my calories were up or my calories were down. And so many times I would be in a cut getting ready for a show, but because of the consistency, the great programming, not missing any days, I would see like, oh my God, I just hit a squat PR. Oh my God, I just hit a deadlift PR. That's crazy. I'm in a calorie deficit. How is that possible? But it does. It highlights how much those movements are a skill and that if you are just consistent as shit with those things, how much that can start to build up. Yeah, I haven't had that quite as much. I mean, in like one thing I did notice though was like as I've cut down a bit, like my stamina was substantially better. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in the lefts too. So if I was doing a few um, reps, like I, I was able to feel stronger in that regard in terms of like getting through them like super easy. But yeah, I, I would say it's not common. Uh, if this happens to you, man, everything is working really well. You do see this though when the cut improves someone's health. So I would see this with clients, but they're more like beginners, right? Where they're cutting and their health is improving mm-hmm. and they don't, they haven't been lifting weights for There's five or 10 years. also gains. Yeah. yeah so it's like they've it. only, they've only been working out for a year or six months. Um, and then diet is really improving their health. And then you would see this, this strength, you know, come up through the roof because their health was a lot better. Yeah. But if you've been dialed for 
five or six years or 10 years and you, you train really well and then you cut your calories, you can expect to at least not get stronger. So I don't want people to take the wrong thing away <laughs> yeah. from this and be like, oh, my workout it's programming. It's an anomaly, but I, I have seen it happen for sure. Yeah. Like I said, it's happened to me, but it's not, you know, 95% of the time, if I cut my calories, my strength, my goal is to keep my strength the same. Usually I see it go down. So that's the more, that's the more common thing. But if you're one of those people, your strength goes up on a cut like you are, this is amazing. Like you should, you should bask in the glory of your workout yeah. programming because it's amazing at that point. Next question is from Kirsten Kimura. What still surprises you guys about each other, even after all these years of knowing each other so well and working together? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to change the question because I don't think, well, maybe, maybe you guys, I don't think anything surprises me anymore with these guys. I've been, we've all been together now for eight years plus. Um, so, I would say what continues to impress me because I'm still impressed, um, but nothing surprises me. I feel like I, I think we've built a brotherhood and a bond and a consistency with each other for so long now. At least that's how I feel about you guys. Like when I, when I think I about, I don't like you guys that much. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't remember the last time someone did something. I was like, wow, I was really surprised Sal did yeah, that. It's yeah, like, yeah. I feel like I know you all so well, That's true. but yeah. I'm continually impressed with what everybody individually does. So I, I would that's say. A, well, that's a good way to say it because I, I, I can agree with that. I think um, what's interesting is just when I think I figured one of you guys out. What I mean by that is uh, like, oh, you know, these are the challenges that they have and this is the thing that, you know, that they like or whatever. Everybody's so growth minded mm -hmm. that what I expect now is the unexpected. So mm -hmm. now I expect the unexpected. I expect that someone's going to act in a way that is evolved from where they were yesterday. And mm -hmm. that constantly happens. And what's cool about that is, and this is, I think one of the, one of the, my favorite things about working uh, on this team is that it pushes me to do the same thing because mm -hmm. because I, if, otherwise I'm left in the dust. Everybody else keeps rising up. That's I'm it. left in the dust if I don't do that for myself. Um, and that's fun for me at least. I enjoy yeah. I enjoy that. I think for me, yeah, it's just noticing those elevations uh, within you guys and then seeing that and being like, oh wow, like Sal's on a new level, Adam's on a new level, Doug's really like like killing it, you know, and like for certain aspects of whatever we're handling within the business or just like the thought process now that goes into some of our content, um, you just start to see like just just where we used to be and like what the struggles used to consist of. And then all of a sudden now that's not even a, an issue. That's not even something we're even talking about or are, are, are trying to figure out each individual person is figuring out their own way of, of elevating their process. Well, I'll go around and, and I'll, I'll be specific for the audience so they know, because I do have things for you guys. Like one of the things that continues to, Jesus Christ, got something in my eye. So you're you're crying right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always, wish. Always the emotional one. <laughs> you wish I get that emotional one. <laughs> no, wait, I'll tell you like something. So Maybe I will. Maybe I will when I get going here. No, uh, one of the things that it continues to impress me uh, with Sal, right? So it doesn't matter what is going on in his personal life. He could be dealing with some crazy shit behind the scenes that nobody knows about, whether it be uh, someone in his family. Uh, we, Him and I could have just got into like a crazy fucking heated argument. He has had the ability to like turn it on immediately. I mean, we rely heavily on him to be the the voice of the brand. He does the most interviews. He gets on big shows and he had it doesn't matter what's going on, his ability to turn it on and and be professional and elevate us every single time is the consistency is is unreal. Mm -hmm. And I think that it highlights the the professionalism and talent to be able to do that. Like if ever, if you're feeling it and you're in the mood and you love what you do, like it's easy to go out there and do it. But I think what separates and I feel like this is like in sports too, like the, the greats have the ability to have a shit storm going on in their life and then still be able to show up and perform at the highest level. So that continues to now I'm not surprised by it anymore. So that's yeah. why it doesn't surprise me because we've been doing this for so long. And there's been so many of those situations where I'm like, God damn, dude, he just went from like yelling with me to like all of a sudden, hey, I'm Sal the Stefano. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's that like, really awesome. That's yeah, yeah really, really <laughs> totally, good yeah. to be able to do the that. Switch just goes right. On, yeah. And I've seen that so many times now that I'm never surprised, but I'm continually uh impressed by it. 
uh, Justin has this uh, ability to no matter no matter what critic critics say about him or think that what he needs to do like he allows to he shuts down all the noise about everybody else and continues to focus on himself and his personal growth and doesn't get distracted by that stuff. He's continued to take on so much responsibility that doesn't get a lot of knowledge or get acknowledgement because it's not like Sal where he's on the forefront and and the voice and talking a lot. There's so much that has to happen behind the scenes. He's got to be the most secure, one of the most secure people I know. That's right. Yeah, and, and, and then also to share this platform with two motor mouths like myself <laughs> and Sal and to not allow that to uh, affect his ego. Behind the scenes, I've talked about our team, this is a perfect time to talk about this too because the Warriors just won the championship. I talk about how our team has that similar chemistry of you have, the and I would think of us as like the three core players in the Warriors and why they work so well is that none of them feel like they have to be the superstar, but yet all of them are true superstars. And, and Justin, I think, is the glue to that. He embodies that the most, has the ability to bring as much to the table as the other guys, but doesn't need the, the same attention from it, the same accolades from it. And so, again, doesn't surprise me because I've known this guy for 15 years. It's why we were so good together back in the days. Similar to him in that Doug is like this. So hands down, uh, nobody, I think, outworks anybody more. Nobody outworks Doug. Uh, and he does. And there, in fact, if you were to probably ask the other guys everything Doug does, I guarantee they would miss at least 75% of actually what he does. Yeah, probably. Truth. And he does, and he just does it. I he think just, he just searches Google sometimes for us when we ask him. He does, he does, <laughs> he does it uh, so consistently, and doesn't complain about it, doesn't bitch about it. He takes a lot of the stress and p pressure of the 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 ugliest part and the unfun part of the business, the parts that the other three guys definitely do not like to do, don't want to do, but is necessary to scale something to this size. And he and it's not been for a stretch or he's hot for a while and then he's off and then he turns it on a little bit. He has been fucking consistent day in and day out for eight years and doesn't need anybody to pump his tires and tell him he's great. And again, it doesn't surprise me because I've been with him for eight years. So I know that he's just going to show up every single day. And so, but it, it continues to impress me because I have my moments. Like I get hot and cold. Like we can talk to me about I'm moody. <laughs> I have moments where I'm on fire. I'm hitting on all the cylinders. I feel like I'm, I'm managing all these things. And the other times I'm like, fuck, I'm overwhelmed. And I'm like feeling sorry for myself. I feel like Doug is never like that. I feel like he's he handles more than anybody handles, and he never needs anything about it, and or doesn't need anybody to tell him that he's doing a great job, and he's just consistent. Yeah, so, I agree with you 100. Yeah. Doug is um, he's master splinter, uh, like with the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> no, I swear to God, you know, the, you know how many times I've looked back to how like, totally, dude, like what, like how Doug reacted to some of the crazy, stupid shit that we've done or wanted to do, mm -hmm. and he's so ninja about it. He allows us to think that or feel like we're the ones that are doing it. When in reality, he's guiding us. And I only see it when I look back. I never see it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like how many times we've done something and Doug's like, yeah, let's, okay, we'll go with that. That's fine. Yeah. And then what it's about this? Idea. And what about that? And then afterwards, I'm like, God damn it. Doug totally moved that in the right direction. But I, And you know why this is so interesting, so like ninja? Because uh, the three of us do not like to be told what to do. Yeah. So the way he does it is so brilliant that, like I said, I can't tell until I look back. So, and then I said that about you, Justin, just, I've never met someone as secure with themselves as you, which is pretty cool because, um, you let people be, uh, who they are. Cause when you're around someone that's really secure, then you don't feel like you have to be anything, but Adam, Adam can see business trends and identify talent like, uh, like a psychic. It's really interesting. Like he'll see things in, in the business cycle, he'll see things in people. He's the all watching eye, and he'll see talent and, and put things together yeah. like a genius. And it's uh, it's really really interesting. He manages the business side of things, and everybody else doesn't just let him do it. We're all happy that he does it because he's the best at it. So, yep. no, it's pretty cool. It's 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 a cool team to work with. And what's cool now is we're developing a team outside of what you guys see here on the show. That is really, I mean, we have a YouTube team now that we're all excited about that's putting the show together on YouTube. So, and you'll notice that the show continues to improve on YouTube and that's a uh, largely result of uh, this team that we're kind of putting together. So, but you know what, you know, what's really cool about this the, the, and I like to go esoteric. So here I go. So everybody, <laughs> everybody get ready. Sal's going to get esoteric. No, I, you know what it is, is that the, 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 
everybody is believes in the bigger purpose and what we're doing. So we have fun, we joke around, we talk about the business, but it all boils down to all of us really believe um, in what we're trying to do. And that has saved us a lot uh, because there's many times we've turned down opportunities and money because it didn't jive mm -hmm. with the bigger purpose. And on its surface, you would say, stupid decision. You just turned down $50,000. You just turned down this big opportunity. And all of us, and even though we toy with the idea, it always boils down to it doesn't feel right. That's not that's not you know in line with what we're trying to do. And then it works out. And then it works out. And it right. works out the way it's supposed to. So well, it's really I think, exciting. I think you know, Sal and I voice our opinion. I really want to hear what Doug and Justin have to say about that. I think this is a really cool question to ask the two of you, uh, what you think. I'm sure the audience cares yes. more about what you guys think actually. The, <laughs> <laughs> the observers. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. Because I, like I, I feel right. like you guys are the ultimate observers. Bro, and I Sal and I are constantly guys. giving our opinions <laughs> all the time. So I believe the audience probably gives two shits what Sal and I think. Yeah. And actually probably would like to hear from the there's two of you. There's definitely differences with you guys, but there's also so many similarities. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, that's the thing where sometimes there's a bit of a clash. But honestly, look at you two guys more as the push and the pull and uh i think that adam is is amazing at at keeping us really focused on growth and really like driving us uh further than i think we would go collectively on our own i just really think that you are the best fitted for driving and steering us uh further than i would have thought we'd, we'd ever be uh, so I think that's, it's just been an amazing to see, you know, how you've been leading, uh, our team. And I, I definitely give you a lot of credit for that. And like everything else you do behind the scenes with, you know, managing, I mean, I don't even know how many people you manage, you manage like <laughs> fucking everybody. So, and you don't get a lot of credit for that. And I want to make sure you, you know, you're highlighted for that. And Sal is just a machine. Uh, I've never seen somebody like, so, uh, just on the spot just has like this fire hose of content ready to go. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know how you do it. Uh, I know that like, there's a lot of things in there that, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've banked over the years. Uh, but just your ability to communicate has made me better. Uh, like I picked up a lot of that from you. Um, and that's been my biggest weakness. So most of my, most of my, um, ability now to, uh, communicate and, and talk through, um, opinions and, and arguments and, um, just conveying information has been, you know, a part of like how you communicate. It's really been helpful for me. Uh, and then just also to just keeping us grounded. So I think you probably do the best job of keeping us grounded on the mission, like the integrity piece, like always just kind of filtering through whatever we're doing is like, is this really who we are? You know, is this, this is what we're about. Uh, and I think that that's probably, you know, the biggest role here is, is, you know, you, you definitely like embody that. Uh, and then with Doug, it's, again, it's just, it's rock solid Doug. Doug is, uh, the, the guy that just like, man, you don't even have to think that, that Doug is, is Doug doing something? He's Doug's doing something right now. <laughs> and we were asking for questions. He's like doing some financials. He's doing, uh, you know, he's talking to, to, to our accountant. He's like, you know, Doug is it, again to his ability to work and just, uh, stay consistent and just, you know, press, uh, like I, I haven't seen somebody work on that level before. And I, I think it's amazing you know, and we were, again, we'd be dead without Doug. Let's yeah. be honest. Like he's just, he does so many things. Uh, so definitely want to give you credit for that. And also just like your attitude, I think is, is definitely what keeps us. And I'm trying to be in that kind of mentality of keeping it chill and like kind of bringing it back and, and calming us down sometimes. Cause we get so hyped up. Uh, but Doug is, is definitely Zen. And we need we need you to always be Zen, Doug. I don't know how you, I don't know how you're Zen when you're dealing. I, I hate financials. Yeah. Like, that would drive me insane. I would be constantly raging. He smiles uh, too the whole yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, but yeah, I, honestly, I, it's it, it's really cool to just see everybody in their roles, just you know, increasing their abilities and and developing uh, to a, a level I've I've never seen. So it's called grin and bear it. <laughs> with the financials. I mean, I love what we do, but I hate half the things I do. Okay. Yeah. But I, I do it because I love it. But, you know, going back to you guys, I mean, Adam, I mean, you know, echoing what Justin said, you you are the CEO, CEO of the company because you are the best at that. You, you see the big picture. 
again, you're touching all types of things. I mean, you oftentimes bring up things like, have we monetized YouTube clips yet? And it's like, you have your finger on the pulse of so many different things in the company. And I also want to say that you have incredible negotiating skills. Oh, yeah. That's I have listened guy. to Adam 100%. on the phone with partners, and he does not budge. You know, yeah. He's I'm, I'm the type dude. of guy who would yeah. crumble yeah. under most of these circumstances. Like, okay, yeah, we'll give you more of this. Or we'll do that. No, Adam doesn't do that. He'll and get you the best deal. He'll get you the <laughs> best it. deal. So yeah. if you ever need yeah. anything negotiated, uh, ask Adam. Not, all the sponsors are not going to call him anymore. They were so all happy the potential when I tell ones. Like, oh, we get a deal with that motherfucker anymore. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> uh, and then for, as far as Sal is concerned, one of the things that always, it doesn't necessarily surprise me anymore, but every time it happens, uh, I, I really enjoy it, is that you're super empathetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if somebody, you know, is having a challenge or, you know, you're just touching base with people and, you know, doing things that are very thoughtful, yeah. uh, things I don't think about doing. You know, sometimes I just get caught up in my own world. I don't think about other people, to be honest. Uh, I was a solo entrepreneur for so many years. I just kind of thought of my own thing. But you're really good at, you know, seeing people, getting the pulse on people and uh, really, you know, checking in with them and being very empathetic. Now, Justin, again, uh, extremely creative guy. I bring this up every time, but he's always shocking me with some of the things that he comes up idea wise <laughs> with, you know, just like his Z-Biotics commercials, for example, super creative stuff. And your delivery on these things is just always improved. And that includes, you know, with the show, just watching you grow with the show. Uh, I mean, you get definitely the, the gold star for that. You know, you've come from, you know, a guy that was not really excited to be in front of a microphone it was not your thing. And now you've made it your thing, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fantastic. And because of that, this, the level of the show has gone to the next level because if it was just Adam and Sal. Mm. It'd be very informative. It would be fun, but not quite more as hate. fun. <laughs> a, lot, right? a lot more hate. <laughs> 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 yeah. no, nothing, you, nothing yeah. surprising though. Right. That's how I feel. I nothing feel like really surprising. I feel no. like that we we've been together long enough now that, that that's everybody's character, man. I mean, yeah. it really, it really has. And maybe the first couple of years together, there was a little bit of surprise like on those things. But I think uh, that we know each other so well now, but it does continue to impress me because it, it, you know, eight years of doing something and to consistently show up and be that. And then to the point that Sal is making is growth on top of that. Yep. So it's like continue to improve, but I can always count on that. And I think Justin said it best too, is just like, if I'm not if I'm not growing leveling up, I know the other guy. We're we're all doing that so much that I always feel that pressure to be pushing myself because I know my partners are, and so yeah. I'll never let off the throttle. Because yeah, of that. you know what the best the best thing is that uh, you hear about this all the time, like a band or a group, and then you know one or two of them get the big ego thing. No, there's no question about that at all here at all. Like yeah. I know it's like do or die. So this whole thing could burn down. Someone could do something stupid. We're all going down with the ship, so I just want people to know we're uncancelable in that in that particular way. You take one of us down, we're all going to hold on together, and we're going to sink with the ship. But we'll be back. So burn anyway, the bridges. It's a yeah. good time. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam, and you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. The rules that apply to somebody who is going from, a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as the, the rules same. that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.